Well, thanks everybody for attending our, our latest uh, Apiculture Online live chat with NC State. Uh, we have a great lineup this evening um, to talk about different aspects, especially about queens and uh, ways to measure them and ways to produce them. Um, so we have a special guest with Patrick Wilbanks from, uh, from Georgia, one of the largest queen producers on the, on the East Coast. So we're very fortunate to have him and, and discuss um, his, his operation and, and how he's able to, to serve as half of the, half the Eastern Seaboard with queens and packages. Um, I'm going to start, however, with our typical first segment where we talk about bees in season. Um, and this is especially helpful and important for uh, kind of beginner beekeepers, hobbyist beekeepers, to really talk about what the bees are doing right now um, and what you should be uh, doing and thinking about doing as a beekeeper. Um, so it's, it's middle of July and uh, summer, I think, is finally here. <laughs> uh, it took a long time. We actually had a very early spring and then a very long spring, and it took a long time for summer to finally get here. But now it's here with a vengeance, and, and, and it's going to be consistently hot. Um, there have been, or at least Jennifer tells me, that there have been these reports of a, of a kind of a weird late nectar flow. The nectar flow seemed to just stop and shut off. Um, but she's finding drippy combs and they're finding something somewhere. Nobody kind of really knows what it is. But um, just keep that in mind. Um, check to see if any of your uh, supers are, are still, or any of your honeycombs are still a little bit drippy with nectar, which means they still need some more ripening to do uh, before you start pulling them off. So just something to think about. Because we had such an early spring and such a kind of a long, prolonged period of, of brood rearing, you could guess and predict that uh, the mite levels uh, started early and started ramping up early, and boy, is that the case. Um, uh, Jennifer already in our research apiaries are finding uh, fairly high levels of mites. Um, so if you normally don't start monitoring until later on in the, in the season, this is not the year to wait. Uh, definitely start monitoring and, and doing your uh, your alcohol washes or your, your sugar shakes or however you go about monitoring for your mites and trying to keep them in control. But one thing, you know, that we need to remember when it comes to the heat of the summer, and this is something that you're going to have to be helping with your, your bees for the next several months, is ensuring a good source of water. Uh, this is something that they will find on their own anyway, but uh, you can really make it a lot easier on them so that they spend a lot less energy and they don't, you know, bother your neighbors or anything like that. They need that water source and they will find whatever is closest and convenient. They usually like to find the closest water source that they can find that has good, clean, not stagnant water, although they're not nearly as picky as we might be if we would drink it. Um, and especially something that has uh, a shoreline, right, where they don't drown. They don't, they obviously don't want to drown in big puddles of water. So they, they like to find kind of small little, little droplets that they'll just suck it up and bring it back to the, to the hive. And they use it um, to cool down. So again, you know, they get thirsty just like all animals. And so they'll drink it and they'll thin out the honey with it. But by and large, especially during the summer, this is when they're using it for evaporative cooling, just like we do with sweating. You know, as, as the sweat evaporates from our body, it takes energy to do so, and it, it wicks the, the heat away from the body, therefore cooling us down. And so the bees do exactly the same thing, where the water foragers will, will go out, find the water, come back, and they'll spread it on the surface of the combs, usually, you know, capped brood or um, something like that. And then they'll turn around and they'll fan their wings. And so they'll create airflow, which aids in that evaporative cooling and it wicks, uh, it, it vents that hot air out from the nest. You also see this kind of bearding effect, right, where, um, you know, the, it's so hot inside that rather than generating even more heat, a lot of the bees will just kind of go out and cluster and sit around and not do anything 
um, except have maybe a, an iced tea on the front porch um, just to, to stay cool. So for you first timers, if you see something like this, don't be worried, they're not swarming, they're not mad or anything, they're just cooling off. Um, what's really neat is that you can see at the entrance a lot of times, um, you see all the butts of the bees sticking out at you as they're fanning their wings so that they're venting that hot air out. And um, you don't wanna you know, smoke or disrupt them at all because it really sets up this nice air conditioning uh, and airflow within the hive that takes them a, a while to get back to um, if, you, if you disturb them during that time. Now what you can do as a beekeeper for this is again, you can provide something very close to the bees so that they're not you know, flying to your neighbor's uh, swimming pool or you know, having to fly a, a mile away or something like that just to get water. You can provide them with something um, with these kind of automatic drip things like these, um, you know, uh, these pet trays. You just wanna fill it with rocks or twigs or something again so that they can land and, and be on the, on the shoreline and not drown at all. You can use an inverted jar, uh, something fancy like this. One of these is really good. We have a big bucket that is just has a small drip that comes out the bottom um, and it goes on to, to a board that has these grooves cut into it. So there's this kind of small little channel of water that goes down. You don't have to refill it nearly as often, um, but there's plenty of, of, of access for the bees to, to go to it um, and they'll, they'll love you for it. So if you can provide this for them, um, if they don't readily have, you know, some other obvious place of water, go ahead and do this and, and they'll be able to keep themselves cool without um, exerting a whole lot of energy. Now, again, the best thing to do is, as a beekeeper um, is to think a good one or two brood cycles ahead. And since a brood cycle is about three weeks, you want to be thinking a good month ahead of where your bees are going to be so that you can do things now to try to predict that and to help them in whatever they're kind of growing or retracting or whatever they might need. And so as I mentioned before, just remember that the mites are already starting to get out of hand. So monitoring them and, and just trying to stymie their buildup so that the mites just don't kind of exponentially build up. Um, there's lots of different control methods. We won't go into them here, but start thinking about different ways to, to have the mites not get out of hand. Another thing too, that even though there's kind of this weird nectar flow going on, at least in our area, uh, most of the time summer is just a dearth where there's not a whole lot for them to, to eat out there. So two things to remember, um, especially if they're still brooding up or, or re require more you know, stores, you might need to feed them with some syrup or preferentially, you know, moving them to an area that has some sort of midsummer nectar flow. Uh, but in the absence of any, any food and them, you know, being hungry, they'll start robbing each other out fairly readily. So make sure that you put on your robbing screens in anticipation of them possibly turning on each other. So if you haven't already, you know, go out, reduce the entrance or, or ideally put those robber screens on where the, the weaker colonies can still defend themselves and, and the bigger colonies um, kind of get confused as to how, to how to get into the hive. So make sure that you're doing all of that in the next uh, coming weeks to, to help your bees out. I kind of ran through a lot of that really quickly because I wanted to give our guests here uh, a lot of time to talk about these uh, really exciting topics. So I'm gonna turn it over uh, to two of our program members who are in charge of our uh, Queen and Disease Clinic. That is Aaron McDermott and Brad Metz. And they're gonna talk a little bit about um, this new clinic, or not new, it's been going on for several years now, but um, the ever continuing and advancing clinic that, that we offer through NC State. So Aaron, go ahead, take it away. Awesome, thanks so much, David. Um... Can you guys all see those slides? Yes. Awesome. Um, so as David mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our Queen and Disease Clinic. Um, let me just see if I can convince 
my slides to advance. There we go. So the Queen and Disease Clinic is a, um, an extension initiative that we offer through the lab for beekeepers in our state and also um, across the nation. Um, and we use it in um, tandem with our research to really investigate a lot of the questions that we're interested in, as well as the questions that beekeepers are interested in. Um, and so I'm gonna first talk about the Queen Clinic arm of our clinic, which is headed up by Brad Metz, who you guys will hear from in a bit. Um, and so the way that we often think about the work that we do through the clinic is under these three sort of categories, uh, quality control, quality assurance, and then beekeeper-driven exper experiments. In the case of our queens and drones, for quality control, a lot of the times what we're looking at is large-scale large scale queen breeders or um, you know, bee suppliers who are interested in checking their queen quality, especially if they're changing anything up in their operation, they're changing any of their management, they're seeing issues in their apiaries, um, or even just as a regular checkup to make sure that they're seeing sort of what they expect to be seeing. For quality assurance, what we're often looking at is um, the second arm of that, which is where you've got beekeepers who are purchasing bees and queens, um, and they want to spot check those purchases and maybe compare different sources that they're buying from. Um, again, identify some problems that they might be seeing after those purchases and things like that. And then finally, we look at our beekeeper-driven experiments, which is where regardless of scale, sort of, we have these beekeepers who are interested in asking scientific questions and exploring them in scientific ways, and they do that in consultation with us at the clinic. Um, and so some things that we've looked at previously in this way is effect of miticides, effect of banking, and then some selection for, you know, um, traits that are of interest to some of our collaborators. And so the whole reason that we look at things from this sort of queen side is because the impact of a queen on the colony is, is really major. It sort of goes without saying. So high quality queens head colonies that build better comb, um, collect and store more resources, have more bees, and better survive the winter. Um, and to really even narrow that down further, well-mated queens, which is a kind of high quality queen, um, will head colonies with better disease resistance, better growth, and better survival. Um, and so this is not going to come as a surprise to any beekeeper to know that a, a higher quality queen leads to stronger, healthier colonies. Um, on the flip side of that, a low quality queen can have a significant effect on a colony. Um, and so usually, sort of what the literature says is that a queen's lifespan can be as long as four to five years. But what we hear to beekeepers and you know being in the community and things like that um, are a lot of problems that are attributed to queens. So this sort of regular supersedure of installed packages where you've paid for your bees, you've got the queen and then the bees decide to replace her. Um, there's losses of up to 30% of newly installed queens within six months, which you know if you've paid to replace a queen or you've paid for a, a package or nuke of bees and you're losing that queen, it's a significant loss in productivity that's really problematic. And it's even gotten to the point where yearly queen replacement has become very common in industry because you really can't depend on that queen to maintain a quality colony for longer than a year, even though for all intents and purposes, those queens should live for as long as four or five years. And an interesting thing that we sort of butt up against with these queen problems is this question that we have here at the bottom, which is how do we separate queen problems from colony problems or management problems? A really great example of this is brood pattern, which is something that across the board gets attributed to queens, but um, can also be a colony level effect because if, if the queen is laying a great pattern, the bees are managing it in such a way where they're pulling larvae or, or moving eggs or anything like that, you might see a poor brood pattern that has nothing to do with that queen. And so sometimes we have these situations where beekeepers will replace a queen and not it won't improve the brood pattern. And so that's sort of how you start to get at this idea of, okay, these measurements that we look at, uh, when we call them queen problems, are we really measuring queen problems? Um, which continues to be very interesting to us. Uh, similarly, drones have an impact on queens, which have an impact on colonies. And drones is something that we've started to look at more recently. Um, and it's been really interesting. Um, and 
So what we know is that drone quality and number affects queen mating quality. So a queen will mate with multiple drones. And so availability of quality drones is really important. Um, so we know that sick drones can transmit disease to queens during mating, which can be uh, a really significant impact. We um, have reason to believe that drones that have been exposed to certain pesticides or agrochemicals could transfer more fragile sperm in that mating, which means that that queen is going to be a less successful layer. Um, and this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. These are our effects that we have been measuring in our research, and it's something that we are continuing to look at. There are a lot of questions that uh, we're continuing to ask, and it seems every time we think we've answered one, six more come up. And so this is something that um, we're exploring really actively right now. Um, and that really a lot has been um, research that Brad and also um, Eshmael, who's a member of the lab who I think is on chat right now, um, has, has done a lot of work on that. So uh, this sort of gets into how we take queen measurements and the queen measurements that we're interested in. What you're seeing here are really three different measurements that we take to get at the answer of what is a quality queen. Um, the first is a measurement of size. So what you're looking at there is a picture of a queen under a microscope on the top left there. Um, and we measure the head width and the thorax width. And we uh, use those microscope pictures to do that because that's one of the most accurate ways that we're able to take those measurements. Um, we do also weigh the queens when we're taking those size measurements, which is another important um, measure of size. And then the picture right below that is actually the spermatheca after we've performed the dissection. We also measure the diameter of the spermatheca because that size also, um, you know, is correlated with queen quality. And then finally, the sort of mosaic that we have on the right here is our sperm counting. And that's um, what really helps us get at the nitty gritty here, which answers not only how well mated that queen is, which we uh, correlate that to sperm number, but also the viability of that sperm. So what you're seeing at the bottom there is a differential dye where we use a chemical slurry to tell us which of those sperm are live and which are dead, which is additionally interesting because if you have a really sort of well-mated queen with high sperm numbers, but the viability is not good, you're gonna see a lot of the same negative effects that you would from just a poorly mated queen. Um, and so all of these measures are sort of important to help us measure what would be a quality queen. Um, we use all of them in our calculations when we finally, you know, start to try and get an answer. Um, and the way that we get these samples sent to us, um, there's a couple different sort of options for queens and drones, but typically for queens, we have them mailed live. They absolutely have to be live for this testing. Um, in individual cages with attendants, um, you, if you are familiar with shipping bees, you may have seen before where queens will be alone in their cages and the attendants are in the box. Um, that's not typically something that we do just because we work in a lab setting. And as you might imagine, opening up a box of bees in a lab setting can be challenging. So we usually have attendants in the cages with those live queens. They're shipped overnight to be sure they make it to us live. Um, and with the drones, we have a sort of similar testing method, but um, we actually send out kits for that because drones are a little bit more challenging uh, to get through the mail successfully. And so we have developed a sampling kit for drone work that we send out to interested clients so that uh, we sort of have the best chance for those drones to make it to us live. Um, and with all of these live bees, they're shipped typically with uh, what we call queen candy, which is a hard sugar candy and some sort of source of water, especially right now when it's so hot um, and it can be challenging to get them through the mail. And then finally, after all of that work, what we end up with is a quality report. We do offer a letter grade system, um, which is sort of the first thing that you see really large on that report to give you a sense of where your sample falls um, on our, our research database. And so for the queens and drones, we have, you know, measurements of what poor quality and high quality queens and drones look like, and we let you know where you fall on that continuum. Um, and we offer individual data about individual samples, but also a sort of aggregate um, evaluation of the quality of those, those samples, those beats. And then to switch gears a little bit, the other arm of the clinic is the disease side. And that's a little bit more under my purview. Um, and so we have these same three focuses that we talked about with the queens, which is quality control, quality assurance, and those beekeeper-driven experiments. And so with disease for quality control, 
We've got producers who are interested in checking the health of their apiaries before, during, and after their peak of production during the year. Um, that quality assurance here is beekeepers at all scales who are interested in evaluating the health of their colonies. They could be diagnosing, diagnosing issues they're already seeing, um, preventing future problems, sort of trying to answer the question of why is this colony dying or dead. Um, and oftentimes that's actually done in tandem with mite counting, um, which of course we know that mites are, are important vectors of disease. And, and so a lot of the time those things go hand in hand. When we're talking about measuring disease, we often also talk about measuring mites. And uh, that sort of leads into this idea of our beekeeper driven experiments, which in this case, um, you're gonna notice some similarities where you are talking about those effects of miticide treatments um, and effects of management strategies, which could be anything from you know, brood breaks to, um, to splits to uh, pretty much anything that you would do that might affect mites or might affect health of the colony. And this gives a direct measure of how you know, these different stressors um, affect the disease loads of, of the colony. Um, for anybody who's not already sort of familiar with honeybee viruses, this is just a little bit of background. There are more than 30 viral pathogens that are known to infect honeybees. Um, and they're detectable in the lab in all different stages, adults and brood, in the mites themselves, um, sometimes even in, in the wax comb. Um, and at the heart of it, they can weaken and kill colonies. Um, and we're learning every day more about their effects and their interactions with each other and with other, other stressors. And we don't always have definitive answers about what viral presence or viral titer can mean for colony health or survival. And so from a research perspective, that's something we're very interested in, so, which is a question we get a lot, which is how sick are the bees and at what level of sickness does it start to become a problem? Um, and sort of the you know, cherry on top is that there's no definitive treatment for viruses. So when I uh, get questions about, you know, what should I do about this? The answer always comes back to controlling mites because right now as beekeepers, that's the only thing that we're able to do that has sort of a direct effect on these viral loads. And so for us at the clinic, we have a panel of different diseases that we test for. Most of them are viruses. Um, I have a list here. I'm not gonna read all of it to you because it's not terribly interesting to hear, but some of the ones that might pop out as familiar even to new beekeepers are these paralysis viruses, which there are a handful that we test for, which as the name suggests can cause paralysis-like symptoms where you've got shaking, crawling bees who aren't able to fly and things like that. Um, black queen cell, which is of interest to anybody who rears queens. And what you most typically see with that is blackened dead um, queen larvae and queen cells. Deformed wing virus is probably the one that gets the most talked about and is um, one of the more common. And with deformed wing virus, again, the names usually give you a hint as to what going on is going on. When you do get visible symptoms, it's usually crumpled, unusable wings on bees. Um, and then finally, we have two gut parasites, um, especially Nosema is one that's of interest a lot to beekeepers that we also measure because they can have significant effects on quality uh, of a colony. And so a little bit about our methods for disease detection. We use a test called qPCR, which is a process that allows us to recognize a target disease and actually amplify it so that we're able to measure it. Those are really the three steps is to identify, amplify, and measure. Um, and so there are a lot of, you know, itty bitty little steps that involve very small amounts of liquid moving from one place to another that let us do this. But um, at the heart of it, what we're interested in is, is that panel of viruses and whether or not it's present in that sample and at what level it's present in that sample. And that's what this test allows us to do. Similar to our queens and our drones, we do uh, most frequently work with live samples for disease. Those same battery boxes that we talked a little bit about with the queen shipments, we also most often use for disease shipments. But instead of those sort of queen cages with the bees inside, we typically have a, a single box with a single sample from a colony of loose workers, um, typically 100 to 300 bees, so not all that different from what you might be taking for a mite count. Um, and the reason that we require these live, unlike with the queens, is not because the test takes place on live bees, but it's because the uh, quality of the sample very quickly degrades as if the bees are dead. And so the best way to be sure that we're getting the best measurement we can is to have them arrive live and always be in our control 
after they're or frozen or dead or anything like that because we have special super cooled freezers and things like that that we use to store these kinds of samples. Um, we also offer a report for these, much like we do with the queens. Um, in this case, we give you a glimpse into our current database of viruses. Um, you can see which of those viruses were coming up the most common, um, when we're getting more common high-level infections versus low-level infections and things like that. And then we also offer you a glimpse into what's going on in your bees specifically. We tell you what viruses we detected, how often it was a high, medium, or low level of detection, and then like with the queens, we break it down into individuals. So when we get sent multiple colonies, we offer data on each of those colonies and which viruses were positive and whether it was, again, high, medium, or low. And so if any of this was of particular interest to you, um, if any of it really caught your attention, here are some different ways that you can contact us or find more information about the clinic. A lot of what I just covered and more is on our website. Um, and we have a banner right at the top where you can navigate to the Queen of Disease Clinic through the website. We have unique emails for each of those sort of arms of the clinic, but I guarantee you if you email either of them, you'll get in touch with whoever it is you're looking for. Um, and we've got Honeybee Queen Clinic or Honeybee Disease Clinic at ncsu.edu. You can reach out to us that way. And you can also reach out to us by phone with our public lab number. And so um, we're really excited to work with new clients all the time. Don't convince yourself that because you're a backyard beekeeper that there's no utility to this for you because really if any of these questions sound like things that you've asked yourself before about your bees, there's a chance that, that we have a measurement that can help you answer those questions. Um, and so with that, I think I'm going to pass it on to Brad. Yeah, great. Thanks, Aaron. And go ahead, Brad. Uh, introduce our guest. Yeah, so this isn't necessarily directly related to the Queen Clinic, although it can be. Patrick has worked with us through the Queen Clinic as well, but also has been a huge supporter of our research. Um, and, and just a, 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 wonder, a wonderful person to work with overall. Uh, and I'm sure many of you recognize the name, but maybe haven't had a chance to see him or talk to him in person. Uh, this is Patrick Wilbanks. I... <laughs> Hey, Brad, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so why don't we start then with just a brief introduction of yourself and your business, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, Will Banks Apries um, has been around quite a while. I'm actually fifth generation in the family business. Um, and we operate about 7,000 colonies and about 11,000 queen nukes and about a 75 mile radius uh, of Claxton, Georgia, which is, if many of you know where Savannah is, we're about an hour west of there. Um, we're fortunate that we have a low um, population of hobby beekeepers in the area or other beekeepers. So we're fairly isolated and able to um, somewhat control our genetics and breeding as a result of that. Um, unlike some other queen rearers in other parts of the countries that are saturated and, you know, can throw a rock and hit another queen breeder across the branch. So um, that helps us uh, have a little bit more control and um, understanding of, of what's happening in our apiaries. And um, so our, our main business is, is raising queens and package bees. And, we ship a lot of package bees um, all over the country, the Midwest, New England states in early spring. Uh, and we ship queen bees um, from uh, mid-March all the way up through uh, mid-October, um, basically all over the country. Um, our distribution of queens is probably, uh, half of them go west of the Mississippi and half east of the Mississippi. So, um, a lot of queens going in different directions of the country. Um, we raise Italians. Um, we've stuck with the uh, Italian uh, genetics just because uh, in our experience, uh, they're just a, a better overall um, breed uh, for raising bee, producing bees and uh, honey. Um, certainly there's, there's other uh, strains that have uh, certain specific desirable characteristics, but 
Um, our uh, longtime customers, many of them's generational, um, have been happy with our, our stock. And um, in order to maintain our stock, uh, we do um, pull in uh, queens from other reputable Italian breeders around the country um, each year. And we'll start those uh, hives on uh, direct foundation and with packaged bees. And we'll let them produce several cycles of bees and then we'll go through them and we may find uh, ones that we like the characteristics and, and select as a breeder to give us some genetic diversity. Um, we've, we've brought in some uh, inseminated uh, poline stock um, and we basically throughout uh, the year as we work through our 7,000 colonies, we're continually marking hives that have great characteristics um, great brood patterns, low mite counts, good honey production, gentle bees, all the desirable characteristics that beekeepers are looking for. And so several times a year we go through and narrow those down to a select number of breeders and we'll use uh, typically anywhere from four to six breeder queens at a time to graft around 12,000 uh, eggs a day um, to then raise queen bees from. Um, Actually, Patrick, if I can jump in there just, just really quickly. Sure. Um, so one thing that has always been a dream of mine, but I think it's still like not logistically possible at this point, but we know that, um, that the viruses that Aaron had just talked about and that we measure in the clinic um, are transmitted from queen to offspring right? And so it's, it's vertically transmitted as well as horizontally transmitted by, by the, the Varroa mites. And so one of the things that, that I would love is to have um, the virus screens as part of your selection criteria. So that's one of the many factors that, you know, you can select during, um, you know, who you're choosing as your, as your breeder stock, right? But yeah, the turnaround that, time is not enough. Like we, we wouldn't be able to get you that, that data quick enough for you to make that determination. So what are the things that you're looking for, you know, um, while we're trying to make this process faster to, to measure the, the viruses, but what are the other things that you're looking for for those breeder queens? Well, certainly low mite counts is, is uh, one of the highest uh, factors that we're looking for. Um, Many of the others, you know, uh, good brood patterns, gentle bees, uh, honey, honey producers, those are kind of inherent in our stock, but we're always striving to see low mite counts. And so, and if we have low mite counts, we're going to have low viral levels or lower viral levels. So that, that is, is key right now. Uh, certainly, if we were to have a, a, a quick response, be able to integrate into our selection process um, a viral study of those breeder queens, and, and that would be an additional uh, trait that we would be able to narrow down and better select the best breeders. Because as I said, you know, we start out with a large number, probably 50 queens that are selected. And, and then we keep narrowing those down till we come up with about anywhere from four to six that we use at any given time. Um, so the bulk of the queens you sell for a year are coming mostly from like six or so breeder queens? Yes. Now, okay. start, we'll start in January with breeders that we selected in the fall and we'll recheck them and narrow them down even further in January. And we'll start our, our January grafting early spring from those four to six breeders. And then usually in May, we've already picked some more during our process of going through shaking package bees, working through all those 7,000 colonies, several cycles. We'll pick some more. And in May and early June, we'll go through and pick some new breeders. And we'll replace those breeders that we chose and had been using back in January. Okay. There's a reason to replace them just to keep some diversity there 
but also those breeder queens when you're when you're you know counting on them to produce eggs for you to graft from seven days a week all spring long they get they get worn out so the the number of eggs they lay starts slowing down um you know after six months or so uh, so there's there's a there's also opportunity for one just as you're working the breeder hives each day exchanging combs for you to to kill one of them accidentally there's always something that could happen so we've always got to have a, a good backup of breeders um, so breeder selection is a constant process and being able to in, incorporate uh, viral studies into that would be great um, well we're working on it we'll try and turn that around, around as quick as you can so I mean, one our, thing oh go ahead. go ahead David sorry I'm you, always a little slower on the uptake no go ahead well, so I, I heard you talking, we were talking a little bit about stock and selection mechanisms. You know, as you well, you know, because we've worked on this in the past, one thing that I'm always interested in the, is in the males. So how much of that kind of energy and focus on traits and stuff goes into your male producing colonies? Yeah. Or, so that's, that's I know you have your out yards and things. Oh, yeah. So so we've got our, our, our queen mating yards um, and all the little baby noops. And we try to saturate those with colony yards that'll have around 60 colonies. We usually have um, two to three colony yards surrounding those queen mating nukes within a half to a mile, okay, okay. in all directions. So hopefully all the DCAs, the drone congregation areas that we're, we're being able to provide drones to and the hives that we put in those locations, we they're almost like some of the breeders that we don't choose for breeder queens, the next level, or even if we've got extra breeders, like, okay, well, we've got 10 here and we only need five and we can't decide, okay, well, those other five that we don't choose as breeders, we put those in those what we call drone yards. And the whole purpose of those yards is to produce quality, high quality drones that have the, also have the desirable character resistance. Because if we just stuck any hives in those drone yards and didn't have any genetic selection there, then we may produce a queen, a virgin queen, but who she mates with would be out of our control and we wouldn't know what the result is down the line. Fortunately, yep. Um, us not just selling queens to other beekeepers and customers, but also having 7,000 hives that we requeen each year. Um, right. We're able to see the results of our queen breeding and how our queens that we're producing throughout the year are, are doing, not just after they start laying and are caged and sent and sold off to a customer in 30 days, but how they're performing three months later, how they're performing in the dearths of the summer, um, how they're performing throughout the winter, um, we're able to see them and, and uh, see how they're performing for ourselves, not just take our word for our customers. But what's, what's been great is, is over the last few years, being able to, from the very first queen rearing and caging in the early spring, in early March, all the way to uh, the last caging in October, being able to take random samplings of queens from each queen yard and send them to you guys, UPS overnight, to have them inspected to check the sperm count, sperm viability, and the morphological measures to see not only how we're doing in our uh, queen rearing process, but other environmental factors, how it's affecting them. Weather, yeah. patterns, uh, nectar, derfs, uh, uh, pesticides, um, mite treatments. So we're able to see, you know, how that sperm viability, the sperm count, and the queen size is being affected. And, um, and then when we see some, if we see a negative impact, we're able to react quickly. Okay, we need to get more drones placed in that queen yard location. We need to add supplemental pollen in that area right now. 
Um, we need to have uh, more nurse bees around the queen cells during those first nine days that they're in the cell building colonies. So there's a tremendous amount of data in, in the testing that you do that gives us insight how to make changes and improvements and and even add and make it even better than than just having a good queen. And no, I think that's really now interesting. Have the capabilities to test the drones as well, um, because we, you know, in the past we've just made assumptions. Hey, we picked some good queens um, with good genetics. We're putting them in our drone yards, and so we're assuming we're going to have some good queens come off to be able to mate with these virgins off of our selected breeders. So uh, being able to check that drone quality as well is really exciting. And that, I think that kind of, you know, completes the puzzle of um, gives us a lot of tools to work with and, and uh, make improvements in our operation. I think that's really interesting. I know I was thinking about this the other day because I know you um, you'll often send samples from the same general areas or at least their name. So you, you undoubtedly have a long, a, a, a longitudinal picture of how that apiary changes over time. And I was always curious what you've done on the back end in between when those samples happen. I know sometimes it's, it's a quality assurance check, but I know because we've talked off and on that you'll, you'll make changes and tweaks. So that's really interesting to hear that you're um, manipulating things in response to what you're seeing. Uh, I guess on a related note, I'm sort of curious because I'm not a breeder, I'm not a geneticist in that regard, and I'm barely in that world. Um, when you add traits, you mentioned you, you've, you've, you've looked into things like the pole line and stuff like that. If you're going to add that to your stock, like how, like how big of an impact does a small amount of queens have in what you observe? And is that sort of time delayed or do you... Um, have to make big changes or can you use small amounts of sort of unique genetic material and start to see changes? <laughs> it, it's a really frustrating process because it's so slow. Um, you know, once you pick a, let's say we picked a breeder today. Um, and so the key is um, that breeder producing a, a high quality daughter that's going to have all those characteristics and maybe even more. <laughs> and so, uh, so we start grafting off of her. We get a daughter. We put it in a hive. Um, we try to have that hive uh, free of mites, a good healthy hive, and then we've got to let it be. We've got to let it be exposed to the elements, um, exposed to, you know, not being treated. And it'll be next spring before we can even make a decision and evaluate whether or not to then take her and use her as a breeder. Gotcha. Because, you know, she may, may end up being a good honey producer, survive the dearths of summer, survive the winter. But if she's got high mite counts in the spring, then she doesn't make the cut. Gotcha. Yeah. Versa. So it's a really slow process. And a lot of people think, oh, once they get this breeder that's, that's got low mite counts, a good honey producer, well, they're just set. You know, they can just graft off of her and they don't have to have any more worries about future generations. <coughs> Excuse me, that's not the case. It is a, you have to, to make it a, a continual part of your operation and process. You're continually going through this cycle. I got gotcha. you. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, it occurs to me that I'm almost out of time. I could sit here and talk to you forever. Um, Let's go ahead with one more question, and I'll I'll start um, opening it up to to others well, to to well, type well, in. But one last question. On. Yeah, I was I was queuing in on what what might be going through the YouTube's there to see if that was. But yeah, why don't you go ahead? So I'm not monopolizing the conversation. If you had a question. Oh, did I miss it? Nope. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think, um, let's see, what would be, there's several that are coming in that are, uh, that I'm trying to make a good segue here. 
Um, I guess I'll, I'll make a, a segue about um, uh, the, the shipping and the temperature. I think there's, there's uh, evidence coming out of our lab and, and others that are really showing that um, uh, ship overheating is something that all beekeepers are trying to avoid um, by, you know, if the bees overheat, they all die, right? So that's obviously bad. Um, and so a lot of uh, beekeepers compensate and really cool, cool them down um, shipping queens because, you know, they cluster and they naturally, you know, keep themselves warm. But it's suggesting that the, the queens might live, but the sperm might die in the spermatheca, right? So um, I, I know that that's not really as much of a, um, an issue or really out of, out of your hands as you're, as you're shipping queens. Um, but do you have any recommendations for what your customers might do when they receive your queens and the handling of the queens between receiving them in the mail and putting them in a hive? Sure. Yeah, that, that's huge um, because it really fr would frustrate us to produce a really high quality queen, have her in a, a battery box ready to go to a customer, and then something happened during transit that just ruins her quality. And we only ship uh, UPS next day air. Um, second day air we've had some issues with we so we encourage customers to pay a little more to go with the ups next day air um, we have used a postal service in the past but this year with the uh, covid 19 issues uh, they've been slower and less reliable um, so um, we really haven't had too many problems with ups uh, fortunately um, our uh, UPS uh, pickup is the last uh, pickup of the uh, truck of the day. Um, and if they have a, a heavy load and heavy day, we'll even drive and meet them to offload the queen so that they're on the way to the hub. Um, and all those queens aren't being hauled around in a hot brown truck in the late summer afternoon. Um, so we have control of at least of that um, and it's usually a, a 15 minute drive to the hub uh, where there they get put on a plane and so um, that's that's a good situation now also what we encourage customers to do is if they have a UPS customer service center nearby that they have the queen shipped to that center and they go pick the queens up at the center rather than the queens arriving at the center getting loaded on a truck um, and then delivered to the customer sometime during that day before dark could be you know midday or late afternoon they've been hauled around in that truck in the heat all day that's right so there's a lot of opportunities to minimize the exposure to heat and cold if it's early spring or say um, uh, October even for some parts of the country so um, next day air you know if you're going to invest in a queen go ahead and spend the money to minimize the amount of time they're in transit um, know that we're gonna um, load the queens and UPS truck at the last um, pickup of the day um, have them shipped to a customer service center uh, and pick them up there rather than riding around on the delivery truck all day before they get to you. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to, to reduce those risks. That's great, thanks. We, we actually are, are working with a, a couple of other large queen breeders, and Jeff Pettis and Daniel Dowdy, on some uh, uh, proper handling uh, yeah. procedures um, for um, all the, the carriers, the UPS and the Postal Service, um, to help educate their employees and improve the process so that they can understand the needs of being able to ship queens of high quality and good condition. And we also understand the logistic uh, constraints and, and things that they run into and can better prepare as far as packaging. Yeah, I think they, they do an overall really excellent job it's just that a lot is, um, there's a lot of variables involved 
Um, and I think the, the margin for error is a lot less than I think a lot of beekeepers had thought before, right? So it's just right. some, something there, to think about. And there's other uh, UPS now, when we, we have a tracking system so that if there's a delay that occurs, um, we get an alert um, from UPS. So we know that they missed a plane or a plane was delayed due to weather. Right. Right. And we immediately can contact our customer service person and have them try to uh, locate the queens and make sure that they're held up, they're being kept in a cool place. And we can also alert the customer that, hey, there has been a delay and this is what to expect and try to um, circumvent any, any further delays. So here's another really good question that I can't think of somebody better to, to answer this. Uh, because did, did you say you ran 11,000 mating nukes? <laughs> um, that, that some folks on the, on the YouTube, watching on the YouTube here, um, have been having problems of putting in those ripe queen cells into the mating nukes, but then the workers in those mating nukes tearing them down before they actually hatch. Um, and there's that, that behavior, which is kind of odd in and of itself, has been increasing in frequency over the last several years. Have you been seeing that at any chance, or do, do you know, um, you know, what might be causing that, pheromones or the, you know, age structure of the nukes or anything like that? No, that's, that's interesting because we, we haven't run into that, that problem. Um, usually when we cage our nukes, um, we wait till the next day to put a new queen cell in them. So there is a, a break. Um, you know, I think a lot of the research shows that the hive really knows that it's queenless within, you know, 30 minutes or an hour, maybe. But um, it, it's just uh, uh, logistical for us and, and, and makes sense to give that small uh, break. Um, if we cage today, then we're not going to put the queen's, new queen cell in until tomorrow. So there's at least 12 to 24 hour a gap there um, and then that queen cell is going to hatch you know uh, usually maybe four to six hours or longer after it's put in the nuke so when you're putting the cell in the nuke if you're disturbing the bees um, and the virgin hatches 30 minutes later they still may be maybe in the defensive mode and ball the queen I see yeah. so the timing of when the cell is going to hatch and you putting it in the nuke is key um, you want to put it in the nuke in a calm uh, time of the day you know early morning the bees are going to be more aggressive so maybe wait till it warms up and the bees are out flying and uh, foraging um, to put the cell in, um, make sure that you, you know, smoke the hive, maybe add something like some, a spray of Complete Bee or Honey Bee Healthy with some sugar water, something to make the introduction of the cell pleasant to the bees and not have the defense. Um, right, right. Okay. So those, those may be some, uh, some ways to uh, uh, minimize that. Okay. No, great. Thank you. Um, there's actually been a couple questions very, we're kind of broadening out here. Um, and so not necessarily for, for you, Patrick. Um, but as usual, we're, we're joined on our zoom call here by our, our colleagues in the uh, North Carolina department of agriculture, um, uh, all across the state. And so, uh, one of them, I, I didn't see, um, Adolphus Leonard, uh, in the Eastern part There's some, some people in the Eastern part of North Carolina are asking uh, how and when to set up their their colonies for overwintering. I think it's good that that you're thinking pretty far ahead. But uh, Greg Ferris or Don, um, one of the other inspectors, do you guys have any suggestions, at least on the eastern part of the state, um, when you might start thinking about uh, batting them down for winter? Well, I know. <clears throat> excuse me. I do not. I have so little experience with keeping bees um, on the plains, on the uh, coastal plains there. Um, I know where I am, which is foothills before you get to the mountains. Um, I encourage beekeepers to start their preparations in the next couple of weeks. And that is my counts, like you've already suggested. Uh, treatment, you know, as necessary. Um, 
But anyway, I'm making sure, making sure that you end up with um, healthy nurse bees raising the winter bees. So my, my encouragement is be looking ahead to, to winter now. Um, of course, you're gonna be concerned about mites, um, but certainly the, the health of the bees that you have going into the winter. Don, you have anything to add? add to that? Well, again, starting for wintering is making sure your mite levels are low. So yeah, now is, now is an opportune time for most parts of the state to be doing that and uh, making sure you've got the mite levels low just so that the next couple of cycles of bees are the healthiest bees that you can rear. Yeah, because they're going to be the winter bees and they have yeah. to be long lived. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Here's but another. Also, Sorry, go ahead, please. John. Also, down here uh, right now, the people need to be making sure that they're feeding the bees as far as that winter thing. And I have several of them have picked up on it, and they're feeding the heavier syrup at this time. So the bees are actually storing that syrup for the winter because a lot of people who started bees this year, and with the honey flow uh, as bad as it was, the bees are nutritionally uh, hurting right now, and they need those carbs for the winter. And they probably, and, uh, if they started out this year, they put those carbs into making wax, not making honey, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. Um, thank you all for, for that. Um, hopefully that's um, uh, good advice for all those who are asking about overwintering. Again, kudos for thinking this far ahead. Um, here's another head scratcher. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick this over to Brad, but if anybody wants to chime in on this, um, feel free to do so because I answered it and I want to see if um, my answer is actually correct that I typed into the YouTube. Oh, what's, no, the evidence, what's the evidence that um, workers might move eggs um, either in general or specifically into uh, queen cups for queen rearing? When I was looking at that, the evidence was equivocal at best. Um, I have not sought for that since about 2007 and no such information has come to has, has come to my my in my inattention um, but at that time there was nothing that was conclusive um, obviously what would do that was as either direct observation or some sort of known egg phenotype and watching it change if you put dye if you do anything that you can see a difference in it with a human eye, you have no honesty whether or not they're moving it naturally or not, because by the time you can see a difference with that egg, it's already jacked. So to answer your question, I don't think there is much. Um, Good. That was my answer, too. I said it was anecdotal at best where you you find a queen cell, like a, a fully mature queen cell above a queen excluder or something like that, right? But it's not really scientific. Yeah evidence but more anecdotal right so anybody else know of any better evidence than that bees do the weirdest things so <laughs> um but not not that all would of them seem are to be a shocking that would be a shocking behavior and i think as patrick can perhaps attest grafting is not moving eggs is not easy and now when you've got six legs and some fine small mandibles it's perhaps easier there are social insects that do it, but then why have cells in the beginning? I can, so I, I, just, I just highly doubt that the advantages of having a queen in a particular spot outweighs what you could just build a queen cell out of it. And I think the evidence, the fact that they build queen cells in the middle of a comb is pretty strong to suggest that most time, that they're not likely to be moving larvae around or moving. Yeah, I think that question was a, a little bit prompted by something that I said during one of those slides about moving eggs, which really would have probably been more accurate to say um, destroying eggs or cannibalizing eggs, okay. which we have much more evidence for than, than moving eggs. Now that happens um, all the time. Yeah. I yeah, mean, okay. exactly. So, there's, there's so manipulating they, eggs yeah. maybe would be an umbrella term that we could use that would be better backed by science. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Aaron. Um, we're going to try and sneak one last one in here. There's lots of really cool questions in here about QNP and lots of other things, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to kick this last question over to Jennifer, if she's still on the line, um, to explain the difference and the, the pros and cons. I, I was talking about using a uh, robber screens 
versus entrance reducers. Can you explain the difference and, and why you can use a, an entrance reducer as a robber screen, but that's not quite as good? Uh, an entrance reducer slows down the number of bees that can go in and out at a given time. It reduces the space that needs to be guarded. A robber screen is trickier, even for the bees that belong to that colony. They have to learn how to go up and over and then in. And I don't really understand how the other bees don't learn, but the robber bees, when they approach the entrance, they go straight for the scent of the honey and they don't understand how to go up and over and in, even though they have it on their hive too. They're not smart enough to figure it out on this side. So that's the difference and it, it really does work. I, I'm a strong believer in robber screens. And it, and it came up because those entrance reducers, they can't vent the hot air nearly as quickly, right? Or as well. But the sure. robber screens, they can because the whole entrance is still open, but it's yeah. just blocked by the screen, right? So I think um, that that's what I was alluding to when I was talking about that. Well, there's tons of other questions. I might linger on the, the YouTube and, and chat a little bit more um, with the folks there, those excellent questions. But um, before we sign off, don't forget to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, like and comment uh, away. And then remember that we're doing this every other week. And so our next Apiculture Online is gonna be July 29th. Um, the, uh, the timely topic is gonna be covered by a postdoc in our lab who's, who's housed at uh, UNC Greensboro, Eshmael uh, Amiri, who's gonna be talking about some of his uh, research on eggs. Um, and the differential size of eggs that queens can lay. And then our interview is his co-advisor uh, at UNCG, who just recently moved to the University of Alberta, uh, Olav Rupel. And so uh, be sure to, uh, to tune in two weeks from today. Thank you again, uh, all the presenters, uh, Aaron and Brad, and especially Patrick for uh, your insights and um, being our guest interview. Thanks again, everybody. Yes, thanks all.